Hello and welcome to the Poetry Exchange. I'm Michael Schaefer. And I'm Fiona Bennett. It's fantastic to see you, Michael. Busy month. We've both been kind of busy, busy. And uh, we've glimpsed each other in person, in passing. But not, sadly, in order to raise a glass of champagne. Because we do have something to celebrate and we've not had the chance to do it. So we're going to start right there this month. We have, excitingly, had final sign-off on the anthology from our fabulous publishers, Quercus. And so it's, it's all happening. It's so close now, Fiona, to actually having it in our hands. I can't wait. I know. It's extraordinary, isn't it? And actually to sort of see that screen version of the book. The more and more the brilliant people who are working on typesetting do their work, the closer it looks to a book, but it is still on a screen. So you have to sort of sit on your hands and go, it's okay, it will come. But yeah, it's very exciting, Michael, isn't it? It's available to pre-order. It comes out May the 9th. Is that right? May the 9th? It is. I can't believe you think you don't know that day. I know you do. (laughs) It's etched across my soul. So, yes, we're in the process of planning events, and we will, of course, let you know as soon as we've got some details around that. And it is also extremely exciting, Michael, to be sharing this month's episode, because we had the wonderful experience of talking with the fantastic poet and ambassador of poetry that is Malika Booker, who was also forward prize best single poem winner, as I'm sure many of you know, in 2023. She's been a friend of the project for a long time and a great enabler of our work. And we were thrilled that she won the prize for her brilliant poem, Libation. And it was just a perfect thing that we were able to speak to her. She's won the prize twice, of course. I think I'm right in saying, Michael. I think you are right in saying that, Fiona. I think she won it in 2020 for The Little Miracles and yeah, it was fantastic to speak to her. It kind of felt overdue, didn't it? So sort of really wonderful to be able to do it at that moment with such an interesting choice of poem as well that seemed to kind of have a lot of echoes with her own work. So you'll be hearing myself and Fiona talking about The Domestic Science of Sunday Dinner by Lorna Goodison, the poem that's been a friend to Malaika. She just invite you to give it a read for us. Yeah, that'd be lovely. Okay. There's a soaking of peas, the red kidney beans, dried out for hard life, which need to be revived through the water process, overnight osmosis. There's a seasoning of the meat, always with garlic, which you scrape with the serrated edge of an okopi knife. Mince these cloves of pungent flavour, then slice the circular onions, weeping. Add the savour of salt and the bite of pepper. Add pimento kernels if you want, and judicious cut confetti of hot country pepper. Rub all this in with clean bare hands. Your efforts will return to you as aromas of contentment, harbingers of feasting and well-being on Sunday afternoon. I learned how to prepare Sunday dinners the August when my father was found to be housing aggressive cells of destruction within him, cells which were even amassing for the final battle against his system, which they would win in the closing days of Advent season. Put the peas on after breakfast, my mother said, turning her domain the kitchen over to me, so that she could become his nurse at the end. Their cooking requires close attention. No long water will do, just enough to cover and cook them till they sink to the bottom, then add enough water to boil them again. It's a game, this cooking of the peas. Sometimes you allow them to cook down until they almost burn. It is that cook down near burnt state which produces that taste of reduced and rescued richness. Repeat this boiling process over and over until the hard red legumes soften. Some of them will break open early, provided you do not cook them with salt. The salt you add later when all the peas have softened 
Flavor them again with pressed garlic pearls. Add the strip length of stalks of escallion, pounded to release the onion brother juices. Now toss the fragrant bouquet of thyme into the swirling red waters of the pot, which is even now awaiting the wash, the white tide of coconut milk. This part of the Sunday dinner ceremony in times earlier was conducted by my father, who would be summoned to the kitchen and handed the instruments for performing this ritual, a hammer, a knife, an ice pick, a dry coconut bristling with fibrous hairs, a male coconut in need of a shave, whose one eye you pierce with the ice pick's tip to release a cloudy white fluid. My father pauses to pour the water into a long-stemmed wine glass and lifts it like a chalice to my mother's lips. Then he turns from the tender, holy and gallant gesture and splits open the head of the coconut with a hammer. The shell of the coconut cracks loudly and opens to reveal that inside its thick skull, it is cradling a lining of firm white meat. My father uses the blade of the knife to separate the flesh from the shell, and then he symbolically dips a jagged piece of coconut into sugar and chews upon it. This signals the end of this high domestic ceremony. The coconut flesh is gathered up and grated and squeezed through a strainer. The thick milk is tempered with water. You pour that then like a libation upon the seasoned red bubbling water, which is now ready to receive the rice, clean sifted, picked and washed of all foreign bodies and impurities, like small pebbles and chaff, which remind us that all this is the produce, the bounty of the earth, into which my father is preparing to return. They come together, this integration of rice and peas, steamed in coconut milk, mixed together and left to settle down, into a combined state of readiness. All the time the meat has been roasting, issuing from its side bloody gravy juices. Now, they will be serving her bland hospital food. Spices, meat, mashed potatoes accompanied by pasto vegetables. This pale repast will be attended by a nervous mound of red gelatin and an eye cup of anemic ice cream. They will encourage her to eat this and to be thankful upon this Sunday that at 85 she still lives. For some days she can only feed upon an essential mixture an imitation plasma of salt, sugar and water dripping into her veins through a long winding serpentine tube. Over and over, I watch for signs that hearts are softening, that hard things are breaking open, that in the end, it will all come together like the Sunday dinner rice and peas. As I pray for your soul's safety, mother, as I pray for your blessed release. Thank you, Malika. That was really extraordinary to hear you read that. What a poem. <laughs> it does break you open at the end, doesn't it? It does. And in several places as well. It's it's as once like an interior into this family, but also it's kind of like how you your parents hand over to you and then also how you become the parents. There's so much here. And as I've grown older the poem has meant so much more as life experiences have changed do you go a long way back with this poem Malika? um yes i discovered it years ago i remember that i found it to teach a kitchen and one of the things that i was struck by when i first found it as a novice poet was the ambition of it and one of the things i think we were discussing in that Malika's poetry kitchen was that we would have stopped so much earlier at that point, I felt I was really nervous about time that she took to develop this poem and the fact that she let this poem be so much pages long, the length that it wanted to be. And so that's the first way I discovered it was kind of loving it because something was happening that I didn't understand and also being nervous and intimidated by the, the confidence to take up space, to take up so much white space with the black ink of the poem. I'm struck as you mentioned Malika's Poetry Kitchen. Just say a little bit more about what that was. 
Uh, so Malaika's Poetry Kitchen was a writer's collect. It is a writer's collective, and it's a space for writers to to meet, to develop their craft, and to enable writers to be able to teach and lead the kitchens. And it was because a lot of writers at the time, we were marginalized voices and we didn't have any spaces where we could develop our work. You know, sometimes people felt that we were performative or that we were akin to rappers. And we'd done a, a workshop with a poet called Kwame Dawes at this thing, Spread the Word, put on called Afro Style School. And we'd learned so much in there. And I was sitting in my kitchen talking to Roger saying, oh my gosh, you know, I wish we could have this go on again. And he said, well, let's do it. And I said, well, where should we do it? And he was like, in this house. <laughs> we didn't know what we were doing. We had the stuff that Kwame had taught us and we found June Jordan's Poetry for the People. Then we used it as a kind of template because her book was about how to encourage people to develop their own voices and their own sense of self. So that's where it started. And it was for the majority black voices, but most importantly, it was for marginalized women, you know, queer, working class, people who didn't feel at home in, in some of the spaces that were available for doing workshops, which were mostly liberal middle class spaces. So you would lead workshops and we would just write together and critique each other's work. And also we thought about developing a community as well of writers. Which you did. So amazing. I'm also struck, of course, that it's Malaika's Poetry Kitchen and you've brought us this incredible poem, The Domestic Science of Sunday Dinner. I feel we might need to talk about food, Malaika. <laughs> you know, I think I, I'm into rituals. I mean, one of the things that I felt like Malaika's Poetry Kitchen was, it was like we were eating around the table. People bought food, we shared food, and we wrote together. But I think I'm interested in the rituals, what we pass on, the intergenerational conversations. Food always comes into my life. And it's funny, when I came to the bit where she said, you pour them like a libation, I realized I've been interested for a little while around, around funeral rites. And in this poem, thinking about my own poetry recently, I can see that this poem has still been an influence in my life and has had a much bigger effect than I even thought. What you were saying about ritual, I was really struck by that bit where it, she does name it as a ceremony. She says, this part of the Sunday dinner ceremony in times earlier was conducted by my father. There's a, there's a formality, isn't there, even to that? And then this incredible and handed the instruments for performing this ritual, a hammer, a knife, an ice pick. I just wondered if that, how that resonates for you. What I like is how she slides in these, these almost religious associative words. And then also the idea of ceremony being conducted. To me, it has connotations of priests but summoned um, as well. You're summoned by the father. And, and so there, there's so much religious connotations buried within this. I know that Lorna Goodison speaks about being influenced by the Bible and being influenced particularly by hymns in her work. Shortly after that, we have the, my father pauses to pour the water into a long-stemmed wine glass and lifts it like a chalice. And there's more of that sort of religious iconography. Then there's a real shift, isn't it? Splits open the head of the coconut with the hammer. You go from tender, holy and gallant to splitting open the head of the coconut. I mean, that's just brilliant. This is a highly skilled poem. This is a really difficult poem to write. It changes register. It pulls in the mundane and the everyday, but it makes it so spiritual, so ritualistic. And what's really profound for me is that as a Caribbean child growing up and as a Caribbean woman, on Sunday, you make the Sunday dinner. You do the rice and peas. You come home from church and you put the soaking peas on the fire. So as well, it was seeing something that we do every Sunday as a Caribbean family, seeing it so exalted, making it very extraordinary and giving it back to us. What I'm really noticing is how these stages in the cooking process, they're all moments of transformation, you know, how, how one element affects another. And I guess that's the idea, isn't it, of a religious ritual is that you will move something from one state to another. 
Well, there's something as well in this uh, stanza. Clean, sifted, picked and washed of all foreign bodies and impurities. And there's something about, you know, being washed clean of your sins or something. And also, you know, we know by now that the father's body is riddled with impurities. Yeah. Right. And, and then in the Caribbean, what happened is that is the best rice was exported to the West. And so we were left with the grinny rice. So before you, you cook the rice, you sat down and you made a high little mountain on a tray. And then you would flatten it out and scrape it across. And as you flatten it out, you'd pick out the pebbles because it's we weren't sold the sifted rice. So you'd pick those all up. The mountain on, on one side of the tray would go down. <laughs> And then it would become a mountain on the other side, you know, which, it, which is clean. And then you would wash it. And then when you wash it as well, you would still put it through a sift to sift it just in case there were any impurities still left in. I'm always trying to put picking rice into poems. I think it's such an interesting thing. It's the transitions in this poem, isn't it? And it's almost like... Um, I can't remember. There's a season for living. There's a season for dying. It really feels like it's that language that is that's also in this poem. This is the time for cooking. This is the time that it passes on to me. This is the time that my father is dying, but my father gets up to do this ceremony, but it's the last time he'll do this ceremony. And then at the end, the mother's food is not as rich because the mother can't handle the rich food or it seems to be in a hospital and seems to be not in a place of home. And the language changes to anemic, pale, past, nervous mound of red gelatin. So even if it's red and rich, the plasma of salt, sugar and water, whereas before water was being made rich by this red kidney bean, this coconut milk. It's incredible, that, that final section, because you just aren't expecting that to all start happening. No. Really, in a way, it feels like it builds this biggest sort of moment of bringing the cooking process of change and transformation to the body. Just that bit where she says over and over, I watch for signs that hearts are softening, that hard things are breaking open, that in the end it will all come together. And I always feel like the end feels as if it's a reckoning. This poem is a prayer. Have we just prayed for all of this with you? I start asking, what is prayer? And the thing that I'm touched by in this is the, the domestic science. And I'm struck by the word science. Yeah, that's really interesting, isn't it? Mm. Domestic science, is that that's sort of what they call cookery classes at school, yeah. isn't it, right? Yeah. They call it, there's, there's something about sort of teaching and learning within that. Mm. Perhaps that's also part of the passing on from generation. Yeah. But a really interesting mix with, you know, the science and the spirituality. But it's really interesting because I think that Embedded in religious instruction, growing up Catholic, is this thing of instructions. You're instructed to do this, you follow this, and then you do this, and then he says this, and then you say that. So, but the thing that strikes me about the poem as well is, is the language. And, and, and actually on another level, sometimes this poem can make me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. It makes me want to be in your kitchen. <laughs> So, Malika, over the years of being with it, what would you say its 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 kind of changing place has been for you? Well, I think, as I said, it, uh, you know, it started off as a kind of, oh, my God, can you do this? Can you make these leaps? Stop suddenly and just being a father? Can you just stop suddenly and just being a mother? But gradually, I think, as I've gotten older, as my mum has aged and as you start to realize that you are now more of the adult than the child and certain things that your mom always do, you are doing, the poem then takes on a deeper and a different significance. My mom had a stroke, so I'd be cooking to take food to her in the hospital, in the, in the home. And then looking at the food, all of a sudden I'm reminded of Blorna's mother and, and how important food is. And also my mom says to me, this food is good. And you think, oh God, this food must be good because my mom praised me. Mm. 
So in terms of my life experiences, this poem has shifted and changed and I've unearthed more and more meaning from it. Malika, as I'm sure you know, something that we ask all of our guests on the Poetry Exchange is this, you know, with this idea of poems as friends. Would you be able to tell us what kind of a friend this poem is to you? Hmm. That's a really interesting one. Um, I think this poem is it's a nurturing friend. It's a friend that enables you to be vulnerable because they're vulnerable. It's a friend who lets you into the interior of their world and actually, in a way, allows you to be able to speak about things that are happening in your life that sometimes are really sad and sorrowful, you know, especially when when your parents are getting older and you're just dealing with it and you don't think it's a space to speak about. You don't know how to articulate it. But also I think they're the friend who would hold space for you. They would ground you and hold space for you. They would say to you, you know, don't worry about what's happening because hearts are softening and hard things are breaking open and in the end it'll all come together. It's a very, very reassuring friend, but a friend you can confess to and be, and be completely honest and vulnerable, knowing that their words will be like, like medicine in a way and be reassuring. I don't mean to sort of ambush you with this, but having read your forward best single poem, Libation, I'm very struck by some of the themes that we've been talking about, food, ritual, family, are present in Libation. And I wondered how you would feel about reading Libation for us. Thank you for asking. I wouldn't mind. Libation. You climb into everlasting, and so it begins, ancestor. Nine nights of praise, of honour. White spirits poured into the ground to feed your thirsty mouth. The sting of alcohol at the back of your throat. And so it begins. You join our ancestors' altar. Your existence now relies on memory and traction. How you make your displeasure known through dreams, dropping food as it approaches the lips of the family member's mouth. Feed me, you say. We are hungry. So we create plates and water, plus candles to light your feast of favourite food from this short life. My aunt favoured smoked heron, the salt of it, like the sea, like the salt of the earth with dumpling and hard food, how we feed you to protect us, age old customs, slinking through slavery to remain. The youths might have forgotten every ritual, but remember the classic, to throw spirits for the soul of their fallen brothers. Even these, killed by the hands of kin, skin black like theirs, whose lives became full stops from knives or gunshots, and today, parents bury their young men, while youths too young to know your ways fling down rum, pour whole bottles of spirits by gravesides, part homage, part ancestral, part knowing that they could easily be in there, part thankful for another day. You there, schooling these youth men in how to be ancestors in the afterlife. There's no language in the landscape of our ancestors to contend with all this loss. So pour the rum, just pour. That was the incredible Malika Booker reading her 2023 forward prize winning poem, Libation. A massive thanks to Malika for having the conversation with us and allowing us to share that and for sharing her reading of Libation. It was very, very special indeed. Our thanks also to University of Illinois Press for permission to share Domestic Science of Sunday Dinner by Lorna Goodison 
response from the collection Turn Thanks. So we mentioned Malika's Poetry Kitchen in the conversation and we will put the website address for that in the episode notes. So if you want to find out more about that, you can go there. As you said, Fiona, Malika is not only a fantastic poet, but I mean, she wears many hats, doesn't she? Reminds me a bit of Selena Godden in that way. You know, people that really champion poetry and other poets and want to kind of bring on new voices in that way. It's just fantastic, isn't it? Yes, indeed, Michael. I suppose it's that aspect of more informal community building, generating of new work, but also these poets, many of them, as indeed Malika is also teaching brilliantly and inspiringly as she does at Manchester Metropolitan University and I'm sure elsewhere. So Fee, because we wanted to include Malika's incredible reading of Libation, we didn't get the gift reading, so we're just doing things a little bit differently this month, but we did still want to have a bonus poem. And uh, Fee, I think you found something that, that resonated for you with this month's ep. I did indeed. It's a real pleasure to read this poem by Andrea Vitsky slot from her collection, The Ministry of Flowers. And the poem is entitled, Sukasa. You welcome me into your home, where all is so different. The way the table is set, the way the TV is so loud, the way you jest, the way your sighs are so relevant. But I promise you this, while I am your visitor, I am yours. I will eat what you eat, drink what you drink, and rethink what I think. And I've even been known to speak an accent tinged with a trace of you. Why is this so? I often ask myself. Perhaps it is because you have opened your door, greeted me, with the steam of dinner cooking, a kiss and a smile that makes me want to hang up my coat, pull up a chair and listen anew as I warm my hands by a fireside hearth glowing with you. That's about all we've got time for this month. We'll be back with more Poems as Friends next month. Until then... Thank you for listening.